Okay, everybody, welcome to week 35 of ENM 2020. Um, this week, we basically just had one talk, the, the a Frontiers talk about uh, the genomic basis of ecological niches. Um, and we've got Jorge Marlon and Devon uh, here to field your questions. Um, just a quick note before we jump into questions, and that is that this is the last of our planned um, talks. And so after this, what we're going to do is just hold a few weekly uh, question and answer sessions. And at request from you all, we're going to have focused question and answer sessions. So we'll, we'll take on a particular topic and, um, and even have suggestions from you all. We'll talk about that later, but we'll take on a particular topic within this broader area of distributional ecology and talk about issues related to that topic amongst a bunch of the, the instructors. So we'll do that for a few weeks until, until we run out of gas on that. One last thing is about certificates for the course. Uh, we now have a 50 question, um, call it a quiz, call it an exam, uh, but 50 questions and a bit later in the course that will be sent out to you. And basically the, the basis for issuing certificates will be um, your answers on that exam and your uh, consistency in submitting questions to the question and answer session. Um, a bunch of you have contacted me about exceptions where you had to be out in the field or something like that. Don't worry, we'll deal with that. Anyhow, uh, let's go ahead and start into uh, questions and answers. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into questions. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen so that we can see the list of questions. Any of you guys have something you'd like to start with? <clears throat> okay, well, I'll start you in, then with, I think, Devin, this is mostly for you, um, for these, GWAS studies, what kind of genomic data uh, will offer a better signal for doing associations? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think in our study, the um, SNPs that we used came from whole genome sequencing data, which is ideal because you get the, the densest covering of the genome in terms of SNPs that you can discover. Um, I think you'd want to avoid doing something like UCEs where we know that there's bias in the specific regions of the genome that we're targeting. Um, it can definitely be done with RADFLUC data where you're getting theoretically an unbiased around one or two percent of the genome um, covered, but then you have the issue of if traits you're interested in don't fall into that one or two percent, um, you won't be able to associate them obviously. So although they would be linked, right? So if there's linkage disequilibrium, that would cause a signal in a nearby site, wouldn't it? Um, that's a hope, but there's, <laughs> there's variable LD across the genome as well. So it's um, just a little, a little more difficult to associate. And then um, as you're saying, not as fine scale in terms of if you have one SNP that's causal and that's your only SNP, in a 50 KB region, um, you're not getting very much resolution as to what's actually going on in that genomic region. Yeah, with the whole genome sequencing, you can, in theory, ask how does the protein sequence change, right? Yeah, theoretically, if we can get the stats done well enough that we believe we're seeing the specific uh, base pair changes, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you had if you, I mean, let, let's say you were really, really interested in some trait and, um, and you got it down to just, you know, one site of interest or something like that, um, you could then pretty easily, KK, why don't you use the, 
the new blankets. Go, oh, I'm recording. Go. These are called very obedient little girls. <laughs> uh, you could, in theory, I mean, let's imagine you found one causal gene region, one SNP. You could very easily go in and analyze the the you know what is going on. Was it a a, a silent substitution, or was it a, a meaningful substitution, and what does it change? So, I mean, I, I think the advantage of RadSeq would be cost. Is that correct? Definitely. And probably computational load uh, in, in processing the data, right? Yeah, I think cost is the main one. Just the amount of sequencing that you have to do um, for RadSeq as opposed to whole genomes is at this point still pretty significantly lower. You're, you're not going to need for, a big computer like the ones we used also. <laughs> if you're looking for results and, and kind of rigorousness of results, then you probably would want the whole genome sequences. Yeah, I do think actually that Darwin's Finch example that I showed in the lecture um, was done with RadSeq data. So it's definitely doable, especially if you have most um, of large effect that are acting like they think they do with the bill size in Darwin's Finch. One thing that we were just talking about before we started recording was, um, you know, we saw in the questions, a bunch of people are eager to get into this sort of analysis. And um, it's not easy. I mean, we've, we, our group at, here at KU has spent, what, a year and a quarter analyzing this data set. And you know, some of the analyses, well, most of the analyses require the, the, um, the computing cluster here at KU. Um, and, and we've certainly, I, I'm not gonna say wasted a lot of time, but we've, we've, well, we've lost a lot of time trying to get the analyses right and then redoing them and then redoing them. So, you know, I, I just want to kind of throw out to the, the community who, who may be thinking, okay, I'm jumping into this one. Uh, the data are rare, which is to say we chose Anopheles gambii partly because it's a fascinating species that some of us have been doing research on for years, but also partly because it's a pretty unique data set of having geographic sampling of genomes and multiple genomes per population. That's pretty spectacular and pretty unique. Um, and the analyses, you know, it's not like uh, you could easily do a, a, a 35 week course on doing this work because a lot of the analysis is just now being developed. And I think what, twice we've had papers appear and be published during the course of our study where we read the paper and it's like, oops, got to do this analysis. And so, you know, this is still, this is still an extremely young uh, set of tools and set of questions. So, you know, if you're interested in it, more power to you, but just realize you're, you're, you're taking on a, a pretty serious challenge. How about another question? 3031. 3031. My question is, with this kind of studies, is it possible oops, to determine if a population is a sink or a source? Hmm. Neat question. Mm -hmm. Of course, I don't have an answer for that, and I would like to hear what others uh, Devon or Town or Marl think about it, but I have a feeling that yes, it should be possible. Um, maybe finding the right the right sequences or the right uh, parts of the genome that are highly variable, I would suspect that you could uh, determine whether some uh, uh, populations are 
rather settled and into changing um, genes among the individuals of that population and probably already evolving their own trajectory and whether other populations are just uh, input from other places, maybe using microsatellites or something. But I think it's a very good question and it's an interesting possibility. It is a neat question and you actually answered it completely differently from how I would have answered it. Um, yeah, you can, you can, there's a, this whole field of phylogeography where you could take, you know, geographic genomic data and you can essentially ask questions about recency of derivation. And that would give you an indication of if you've got a population that has, you know, unique alleles and things like that, then it's pretty obviously not a sink population because a sink population is going to blink out and perhaps be recolonized from time to time. So you answered it kind of in a more classical way than I would have. I was trying to come at that question with uh, using the, the genomic basis of niche information that we are deriving. Could you say this particular population has a genomic composition that should not allow it to survive under the conditions present at this site. So it's a totally different way of answering that question of permanency. And I was gonna say probably not because you know these are kind of correlation and we don't really know, I mean, what, what we're doing is we're inferring differences in tolerance from the environmental profiles present at the sites. And one of the things I'm most excited about what we've done with this project is bringing in, you remember the phase two data where we, we took our initial set of candidate loci and we challenged them with a new set of data. And if we didn't see the same pattern with independent data, throw it out. What does Trump say? Get them out of here. Uh, you don't have to joke about those things. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could say about Trump, get him out of here. No, sorry. <laughs> but any anyhow, so I, th I think um, we've done a pretty interesting job with, with holding out data and filtering our sites where if, our genetic sites, where if they do not show the same pattern in two independent data sets, then we're not interested in them. Um, but I think that, you know, the tolerance limits that are associated with these different alleles that's going to be a tough question, but it might be something that one could come back to. I don't know. You, know, you could mean, imagine building a, you know, some sort of multivariate statistical model with the presence and absence or the frequency of each allele and relating that to the, uh, the environments or the environmental extremes present at sites and seeing if you could develop essentially a magnitude of effect estimate. It's something that's, you know, kind of in the back of the head for down the line, but we've got to first deal with, with the idea of identifying candidate causal sites across the genome. Let me just add a little bit more on what you said about like having independent data and having observed the same pattern. That's really important because as we have talked about previously in the course, uh, again here we're using um, kind of macroecological climate variables that are on a scale that's probably not the one that is uh, affecting directly the species. So we, we are using this raster layers to obtain environmental information. And, and that's not necessarily what the species is feeling in, in, in its microhabitat. So uh, that kind of helps with that. Like it's, a, it's assuring that we are observing the same pattern with independent data. 
uh, because it's not the same obtaining values of tolerance of uh, uh, the species from uh, these raster layers than like testing the actual tolerances of the species. And of course, we have talked about all the complications of actually translating those physiological tolerances to these macroecological observations. No? Uh, and I just want to say that it's, it, it again adds in the complications that, that we are mentioning. And there are still better uh, levels of proof like, you know, imagine, and this is, this is completely feasible. Um, imagine that you were to take all of our, I don't know, arid tolerant uh, SNPs and using gene editing approaches, splice them into the genome of uh, humid tolerant populations of Anopheles gambiae you would expect that those individuals would become more arid tolerant with those changed genes. And so you can test these things experimentally, at least in theory. Nobody said it would be easy, but you can. Another question? I think you highlighted some questions. I don't know who, but someone highlighted some questions. We can go in order, right? We can. Let's see. Best model to study the genomic basis of niche traits must be a species that has minimum population structure. I understand that this is because structure will be will add noisy variation will that, that will not allow one to recover true genotype environment relationships. Am I right? Can you explain a little further about this or include an example? Devin, you want to take a shot or? Yeah, um, I think an example actually is another question that was asked. I'm looking at 3043. Um, someone asked about doing the uh, functional genomics essentially of an island population that has a different bill shape than the um, individuals on the mainland. Was and that not you, Devin? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and I, I think that's a really exciting system. That's the kind of thing that we're looking for to do functional genomics. But the thing that um, would be concerning there is exactly what the first question was talking about, which is um, confounding genetic differentiation. So when you only have two different populations, um, you're going to have different alleles on the island that are associated with drift and selection for things that we can't quantify on the island. And essentially that population is just going to be inherently genetically different across the genome, depending on how different, um, how long it's been in isolation from the mainland. And if we don't account for that, then we're, what we're going to end up finding is just differentiation across the genome um, that's not actually associated with our character of interest, whether that is the niche or the bill size in this example. So um, correcting for population differentiation between isolated populations is really important to try to get rid of that, what we would call noise, which is the genomic differentiation not associated with our trait of interest um, so that we can focus in on that signal and find the specific regions of the genome that we think are associated with our trait of interest, whether it's niche or phenotype or anything else. But that's, that's really difficult to do. Um, and it takes, as Tom was saying, a lot of nuanced approaches um, and making sure that the statistics are done as rigorously as possible. Think about it. You're looking amongst millions or tens of millions of, of sites across the genome. And if you have even a modest period of independent evolution, I think the in that 3043, the, the comment was, uh, 30, 40,000 years. That's a hell of a long time for 
let's say, minor allelic differences to accumulate. Now, you may have a different environment. Let's say it's wetter or drier or whatever. All of those SNPs that have drifted apart or that are responding to some other dimension of the environment, maybe the, the, the background color is lighter on the, on the island than on the mainland, whatever, any reason for differentiation, and your two-point comparison is going to pick out all those SNPs and say they are potentially associated. And so as you seek to separate out the ones that really have to do with the environment, you're going to suffer quite a bit. So the two problems in that is, one, the small sample size of sites and the lack of replication of whatever the different environmental conditions are on the island. And what was the other one that I was thinking of? Um, the, the population history, which is essentially going to produce lots of spurious associations. So, uh, so that would be complicated. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Um, <laughs> the interesting thing might be among your mainland populations, are there any sites that look like the island population in the dimensions of the environment that you are interested in? That might be a way of getting some replication. Yeah, I wanted to say also regarding bill size, um, if you do do a genome-wide association um, approach, then a great way to try to get at whether you're being confounded by population structure between the island and the mainland is to ask whether your putative causal SNPs are predicting within population bill size. Mm -hmm. So if you're seeing two groups, one big and one small, and then within um, each of those populations, it's just a scatter in terms of trying to predict the bill size on just the island. That's indicating you're just getting SNPs that are separating the two populations. You're not necessarily getting at the causal SNPs for bill size. And that, that's a neat uh, difference between the niche-related stuff and individual phenotype things. With niche-related stuff, we're essentially trying to characterize a population phenotype. And so we really don't have that possibility open to us. But yeah, you know, within, for individual phenotypic traits, you'd have the potential to go in and say, yeah, the ones that have this SNP have the bigger bills within this population. A further thing you can do with something like bill size, and actually now more and more traits, um, is there are already known a whole series of causal genes. It's probably what, four or five that have been documented, Devin? It's growing all the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Check this morning to see how many more. Um, and so one thing to do is to focus in on those sites and see what those sites are doing. And that has all sorts of neat questions about convergent versus uh, independent evolution of traits. Um, and it also gives you the opportunity to uh, look at those known potential causal sites um, without having to sequence the whole genome. You could develop very rapid, very cheap assays. Okay, another question? Let's see. And the next one is 3042, right? 3042. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Let's see. The study results show that some parts of the genome are closely linked to niche characteristics. Do these results confirm the idea of niche conservatism such that closely related species would have similar niches? 
Okay, well, that's, I mean, I think no, but yes, in one sense. It is suggesting that there's a genetic basis to these niche characteristics. And in that sense, you can expect some inertia through time of niche characteristics. But these sites could be fast evolving or slow evolving. And so, no, not necessarily does that give you uh, niche conservatism. You guys agree or disagree? In fact, they provide you with a tool to study niche conservatism. If you are able to document fast change or not really fast change or not change at all. Yeah, I mean, if you could, if you could document a set of sites across the genome that are um, likely causal um, sites as far as a particular niche dimension, then you could, you could go in and look at the composition of a population or a lineage and see whether, first of all, do they have the genetic variation such that evolution is possible? And second of all, are they changing in frequency or something like that? And niche conservatism not only depends on that, it's also like, it's an entire process that depends on things like natural selection and stuff like that. So it's, it's not just this information that you have to consider when you're talking about niche conservatism. That, that, that's an interesting thing, and it's related to what Town just said. Um, a site may be very conserved because there is no natural selection for it or because there is no variation for it. Uh, you need both in order to have a genetic change. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing because then you, you are allowed to do a mechanistic study of niche conservative, not just a correlational study. I think to me, the neat thing, and really the reason why I was excited about this study, is to start to understand kind of the genomic structure associated with niche. You know, imagine that we had kind of the simplest possible genetic basis, which is one gene. Well, then our niche variation should be quite simple. You know, it might even be a, a, a system with dominance and then we'd have, you know, warm versus cold. And we would know how it, it would be inherited. And genetic drift could easily eliminate one of those alleles in a small population natural selection could act quite quickly. Now, at the other end of the spectrum and more in line with what Devin showed you in the results of our study, we're probably seeing a system with kind of dozens to hundreds of causal genes. And so that turns it into a very polygenic trait. It means that evolution can proceed gradually Whereas if we'd had you know, a single, tra a single uh, site controlling the niche, then you would have something that would be more discrete in its change. And so I think this is really neat in that it tells us how niches can evolve, at least this single example and this single species. But you know, five years from now, we'll have 20 examples like this. And um, I think that starts to get really exciting because it'll, it'll tell us what kind of um, patterns to expect when we do phylogenetic studies of niche. It'll tell us what kinds of individual differences to expect within a population in terms of, I don't wanna say niche, but, but tolerances. You know, we can imagine different individuals having different mixtures of the causal genes. So I think, again, to me, that's the really exciting part. Not so much the list of causal genes, although that's gonna be exciting too. To me, it's the, the, uh, the number of entities on that list. And you know, secondarily, are they all of 
fairly similar small effect or are there big effect and small effect genes? And that's down the road, but those are really exciting uh -huh. questions. Okay, let's look at another question. Okay, Devin, this one's for you. What's the difference between latent factor mixed models, Bayesian gene environment association scan, and random forest regression trees? Can you recommend some papers about them? And could Town put them on the course material? Um, I can definitely recommend papers about it. Um, I could probably talk to you about it for longer than you want to hear about it, but um, essentially the, the latent factor mixed models, all three methods were correcting for population structure before we start. Um, and then the latent factor mixed models are, are um, doing individual regressions between the SNP value as like zero or uh, zero as homozygous reference, one as heterozygous and two as homozygous alternate for a different allele than the reference genome. Um, and then we're taking that value, averaging over the populations, trying to do a regression to get at, um, is there a relationship between the environmental variable and the allele in each of the given populations? Um, base scan is doing a similar thing, but rather than using uh, the regression, it's using the value of FST between the populations, asking is there an allelic difference between these populations? So it's basically just using a different summary statistic to ask the same question. Um, and then the machine learning uh, regression trees that we implemented finally um, is again doing regression, but instead this time doing it in a machine learning framework where it's using a bunch of decision trees to ask if these regressions um, basically are significant or are associated, if the um, allele frequency differences are associated with the environmental variable. And because it's a machine learning um, framework rather than a traditional statistical framework where we get a p-value, um, we use this method called R2VIM um, where it basically runs 10 of these models um, back to back and then takes the lowest possible significance value or um, I think it's called variable importance measure and uses that as um, it only basically only takes SNPs that were had a high variable importance measure in all 10 of our independent runs with a different seed so that it's not um, just exploring a certain area of likelihood space, basically. So that's like a super quick rundown. There's papers associated with all of those three methods that have been published and I can definitely send them to town to have them put up in the materials. Please do. And that way, if people want to dive deeper, they can. Um, interesting is that the, the overlap between the sets of, of SNPs that were uh, identified by each method, the overlap is nowhere near complete. It's, it's, there are certainly some shared sites and there are lots of non-shared sites. So I, I think it's just, these are, these are picking out different kinds of relationships that are manifested in different ways. And you know, another neat thing that, that Devin's done is to find ways to pick out things that are uh, patterns that are unlikely to represent real relationships. And so you can imagine, he showed examples in the talk where the relationship is mostly like this, and then you have one point that's high. And those may be, you know, a positive linear relationship, but we really couldn't imagine a reason why, you know, a, 0.6 frequency of that SNP would be more advantageous in an arid environment than a 0.8 or a 0.4. So, so again, there's a ton of steps that need to be taken to weed out spurious associations and 
probable non-candidate causal relationships. And certainly we've still got some spurious associations in our lists of candidate gene, but I think we're closer to, to um, a really rigorous list. Take a look at another question. Three fifty. Okay, the genomics of the ecological niche talk was interesting. However, knowing the genetic diversity of a species involves considerable funding. The method is restricted to a few species of interest to humans. Is there an alternative to do research with niche genomics without the study of genetic diversity? Somebody start answering because there's a small war breaking out. I'll be ready. <laughs> Nobody going to take that one on? I mean, there's an obvious answer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Wait a couple of years, right? The price is going down so quickly that what was completely impossible 15, 20 years ago, five, 10 years ago, three to five years ago, is now increasingly possible. Seems like the war has calmed, so I won't leave you. <laughs> there are also classic methods to do work with, that don't require uh, sequencing large chunks of the genome. You talk about that before. They have their limitations, uh, but yeah, probably waiting will be the best idea. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, as Dinesh, Alexander Dinesh Filo predicted, some species will be able to tolerate climate change better than expected, <laughs> so we can keep studying them. So. I mean, I think a, a dimension that is near and dear, at least to the heart of one person on this call, is experimental approaches. <laughs> and that may not get you a list of sites across the genome, but it can get you to a, um, a view of likely number of factors involved, number of genes involved. And so this is using quantitative genetic approaches. You can, you can posit um, genetic structures and see how well um, your experimental results fit with different models of uh, genomic structure. That doesn't require the expense of, of genomics. It ex in, instead, it requires the expense or the hard work of the experimentation. Yeah, I mean, it, they, they have different complications uh, and probably it can get as expensive as the other one. <laughs> it depends on what you want to do experimentally. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's an option. You don't have the same final output like uh, the specific gene regions associated with uh, specific traits but or, or things like that, but yeah, as Tom said, you can have a, an idea of what's going on. So, so, you know, we throw this out as a frontier because it is a frontier. It's, you know, I, I, just a few years ago, the only, um, the only large genome that had been sequenced completely was humans. And now we're up to, you know, hundreds of species. Uh, and pretty soon it'll be thousands and tens and thousands of species. And then we're starting to get species like Anopheles gambii, where you have not just a genome, but a geographic genome. And yeah, th those are gonna be species of particular interest, but maybe working with those species of particular interest uh, can give us some lessons about uh, what all species will be like. You know, I'm, as I said before, I'm really fascinated, you know, if, if you do 
10, 20 of this sort of study and all of the niche traits that you look like are highly polygenic, then that's a very different world than if some niche traits are um, governed by single or few genes of large effect. So I think we can, we can do these analyses with the, the, you know, the model species or the important species, and then come back to the species that are, that are perhaps more interesting, you know, the, the rare, the endemic, the sylvatic, the, the non-medically important species, and, and see what we can learn about those from the well-known species. Most of what we know about genetics is from model species, right? This is this is actually like very interesting question to pursue, uh, and it's it's really challenging. Perhaps the best solution will be like try to work in networks, because trying to do this for multiple species or expect that someone does this for multiple species, having the same amount of genome genomes for individuals in different geographic regions, it's, it's going to be really hard. Uh, but, but it's an important question to answer, like knowing, knowing how, what's the genomic basis of niches will tell us a lot about what to expect with oncoming changes. Well, and, and we can go farther than that. Um, and I'm going to tell you all a story. It has to do with two of us on this call, which is, let's take birds, randomly selected, pretty cool taxonomic group. Before you can do the geographic genomics, you have to do the geographic sampling. And let's see, 33 years ago, I set out on my dissertation work and collected about 600 individuals of two species, basically, from across the range of each of the species. And there have been other geographic sampling uh, efforts. Um, one of my favorites is Carla Cicero's work at, at University of California at Berkeley. Um, but it's really interesting that, you know, I did this work with Aphylacoma way back when we were doing protein electrophoresis and getting, you know, zero resolution. Um, but we learned a little bit about the population genetics of those, of those birds. Well, 33 years later, Devin and I were having a, a, a talk the other day and about his dissertation and He's still using the same samples that I collected 33 years ago. And what I'm, the reason I bring this up is that doing that geographic sampling across a species range is amazingly rare. And you know, those of you who are earlier in your careers and, and still able to go out and spend a year in the field or something like that, consider taking on challenges like that because you create permanent resources in terms of specimens and samples and now genomes and things like that. And so, you know, I think my contribution is just, I was able to go out and, and collect 600 J's and decades later, those samples are still seeing use. And that's just, it's, you know, it's not any deep insight of mine, it's just hard work. And so, you know, consider doing these fundamental steps of creating the resources. And you can see the same things in other branches of science, the amazing contributions of keeping bacterial lines um, going for, for decades and decades and watching their evolution, uh, you know, things like that. Long-term science is hard to do, but you can, you can learn things that you won't learn otherwise. 
Yeah, unfortunately, collecting at a large scale is becoming more and more difficult. Um, and what you are describing is just another of the shortfalls that have been described by Kimis Filo and 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 uh, Ortad and others. You remember the taxonomic shortfall? We don't know the species. The Wallacean shortfall, we don't know their distribution. The Prestonian shortfall, we don't know their numbers. Well, this is like maybe the uh, Mendelian or the right hand uh, shortfall, we don't know the genetics. And, and it's becoming more and more difficult to do this large scale um, sampling studies where you would go all over the world collecting uh, specimens and then doing the genetics on, on, on those that you now need permits, you need, you need to have uh, paperwork, you, uh, there are whole mega diverse parts of the world that are off limits to do that sort of work. So. Yeah, it was a pain in the butt 30 some years ago and it's a bigger pain in the butt now. Yeah, but 30 years ago when you collected in Mexico, what permit you needed? I got permits from Cedesol. It was, no, what was the? Cedue. Uh, Cedue, yeah. yeah. And it was a pain in the butt. Easy to get the permit. Now it's a, quite a, a, a pain. Well, at that time it was more difficult. Then it became easier. Now it's difficult again. Exactly, exactly. There was a period after me that, that it became easy. And now you're right, it's a pain in the butt again. Anyhow, the point is there's probably another shortfall before your Mendelian shortfall, which is, I'm trying to think of a good uh, champion of specimens, which is to say, if you don't have the samples, you can't Ro do Ro genetics. Ro Rothschild, the Rothschildian shortfall. <laughs> That's right, the Rothschild short shortfall, uh, which is to say specimens in some sense are forever. And, you know, you can go back and get um, genetic genomic material from old <clears throat> preserved specimens. But high quality, highest information content specimens are particularly rare. And so, you know, all of those hundreds of J's that I collected, we normally... Oh, can you pull a tape off for the baby? Oh, give me one sec, please. I can't hear. Okay, give me one sec. We normally collect, there you go, now you're here. Thanks. Um, we normally collect one and a half or one milliliter of tissue. But for some whatever reason, I don't know why I did it, I collected five milliliters of tissue from each of those specimens. And that means that, you know, several generations of J biologists have been able to go back and sample from my samples. And so, you know, one, all those samples went into liquid nitrogen. Two, there was considerable quantity. But the point is that specimen resource is so rare that it becomes a permanent point of reference. And, you know, I think, yeah, it's tough. It's a pain in the butt, but it is also possible. And I, I particularly admire the people who essentially take the time to do that and generate their own or their, the, yeah, their own specimen resources. Uh, in Devin's case, he's got now the stuff that I collected 30 some years ago and he can go and add to that either to fill gaps strategically or potentially also to look at changes that have happened over three or four decades. You know what, Tom? This, this is an important talk about the collections and specimen. Uh, you should add something like this to the course oh, for gosh. next time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's because even, even biologists nowadays are saying that collecting is not needed anymore and and that's the like the the most obvious lie i have here the most obvious thing that is not correct this there was just published in science the suggestion that 
specimen-based descriptions of species slow down um, the building of the catalog of life and cause damage to conservation efforts because those conservation efforts have to await the publication of the description. I say bullshit, uh, <laughs> which is to say, no way. If a species has been discovered, it can be included in conservation planning, even if it hasn't been described formally, scientifically. But, you know, this commentary was published, I feel, irresponsibly by Science Magazine, where basically you just have some people whining about, oh, these, you know, why do we have to wait for specimens to document a species new to science? Well, you don't. You can include it in your conservation plans as species A or, you know, species 132 or the redheaded form on Mount such and such. You know, it's, it does not have to be a matter of waiting, but we do need the specimen documentation or we'll have a bunch of partially known and partially characterized things that might be species. And there are some pretty offensive examples out there. Uh, in the bird world, the example that we all love to hate, get the name, Laniarius. So it's a bush shrike from East Africa. Laniarius and the species epithet Liberatus. And this was an example where a, this was in, from Somalia, it was a war zone, and there were some people doing some studies of birds at the edge of the war zone. They capture a really cool looking bush shrike right as some unrest was breaking out. So they take the bird to Europe, and this poor bird sits in a cage for years. I'm sure all of its wing musculature was atrophied. They believe it's a new species. When the unrest subsides or shifts to another part of, of Somalia, they go back. And their idea is to liberate this individual because it might be the last individual of its species. Bullshit. Okay. They let it go, but oops, we can't get to the precise site. So they let it go 65 kilometers away from where they initially captured it. They go ahead and describe this species. And so there is a formal name, Laniarius liberatus. With, with a, no specimen. With no specimen. 35 years ago, with a couple of colleagues, I wrote a, a criticism of this stupid happening. And about five years ago, some of the original authors went back and did some new analyses of Laniarius liberatus and published another paper saying, look, this species was a hybrid. <laughs> Which How is, did they know? Uh, well, with modern genetic approaches, you can get at so the specimen. They got actual specimens. Well, it's it's messy. They collected the feathers that the bird molted during its molt cycles, and then there, like some of the best material, I think it was the blood samples that they got from it. That best material got lost. Anyhow, I. It's not worth going into the precise examples, but I kid you not, a very highly placed person whom you know, Jorge, who was the head of an international uh, NGO focused on bird conservation, you know exactly who I'm talking about, was consulted and has been quoted in print as saying, whatever you do, don't kill it. It might be the last of its species. Well, if it is the last of the species, you might as well kill it. Bingo! You win the prize. 
But that is called irresponsible science, where you document something as a species, and it spends decades as this species until you look at it more carefully and you realize it was not a distinct species. Anyhow, specimens are important. No excuse. Yeah, not, Hard not work. Not only for describing a species, like it's like all these things that Devon has been leading in our group, you know, all these things we have been uh, talking about, all the things that we have been talking about in the frontiers, they may depend on this kind of information as well. And the final goal of all of this is to preserve uh, biodiversity, is to help conservation. So I, I, I think we should rethink some, some ideas in our minds if we are thinking that collecting is bad for conservation. <laughs> There is something else. Uh, collecting is not just for taxonomy. There are many other things that you can do with the specimen. Tons of other things. Some of them pretty innovative, like all the genomics. So uh, it's a very narrow-minded uh, approach to think that you are just collecting because you want to put a Latin binomial on something. There are other things you can do, and some of them are pretty powerful and pretty important from a scientific point of view and also from a conservation or applied point of view. Now, they, I, I don't have much patience with this kind of, uh, of people either, Council, you know. Yeah. Put it, I mean, we, we don't need to beat this horse over much, the dead horse, by the way. Um, but people forget about population biology. If there's one individual, there are many. Now we're not talking about you know white rhinos or or you know there are a few you know, cases where you know that there are just ten or yeah. five individuals like white rhinos. Yeah, I mean I'm not going to go out and do geographic genetic sampling of harpy eagles, right? Because I know that their populations are low and sparse and declining. But almost all of the species, including hawks and eagles and things like that, almost all of the species have populations that are substantial that lose individuals to predation or parasitism or disease or old age and harvesting high quality specimens that can support important conservation related diversity related analyses that does not change the probability of extinction of the species because you have to think about populations. So, you know, when I die, my relative load of sins and good deeds will weigh whatever happens to me in eternity, but my conscience will be clear. I've killed lots of birds for specimens. My conscience will be entirely clear that I have not increased the probability of extinction of any of those species. You're going to go to the hell of the taxonomies, you know. I am ready to go and die anytime you want, and I know that that won't be what takes me down to hell, okay? Okay. That kills our hour. <laughs> Any last comments, anybody? <laughs> I know, I don't want to keep beating the dead horse either, but I was curious town and Jorge, if you felt like the, the ever-increasing academic expectations um, and the decrease in museum funding is affecting the ability of researchers and grad students in particular to be able to say that I'm going to take a year and go do really intensive geographic sampling. I don't buy that argument. I mean, there are not a lot of active museums. Um, you know, you and I, all four of us work in one of them. And a lot of institutions have essentially divested themselves. But I know quite a number of people who put in a lot of time in the field developing specimen resources as part of intelligent science. So, you know, look at Rob Moyle, right? He's a full professor at the University of Kansas, and he has developed amazing specimen resources across Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And that hasn't held him back. Now, obviously, he's in a good institutional 
context. But I think even if he were at, you know, University of Missouri or Kansas State University, some university that doesn't have a museum, if he were doing the science that he's doing, he would be respected for it. Yeah, but I wonder if Devin hasn't got a point, because um, this field of research takes time, takes resources, um, certainly the time you have to go to the field, collect the specimens, prepare them, do the analysis and all so on and so on. Uh, and, and the demands of academia these days are becoming more and more pressing and in, in quantitative terms you have to publish at least one paper, maybe two, three, four, uh, ten is better. And uh, there, there is some sort of opposition between the two, the two things. But a, but a smart scientist is developing those resources such that he or she is obtaining those, those insights that allow regular publication, maybe even abundant publication, but also they're developing resources that they can use long into the future. Now, where I will ag agree with you, Jorge and Devon, is you know, take an institution like KU, where KU Ornithology has now a, what, a 27 year tradition, uh, 28 year tradition of investing in uh, sampling of birds around the world. And we've built you know, 30, 40, thousand samples that are these new high quality samples from around the world. We get requests for that material all the time and we very, very rarely say no. But where we do get every so often we get essentially driven to say no is when somebody makes it entirely clear that they do not appreciate the effort, the resources uh, that have gone into developing those, re those, those specimen resources. And so when we have said no, it's been when somebody's come to us and said, um, I'd like tissue samples of all 1600 subossines that you have in your collection. And you ask them, well, what have you added to that resource? And they say, oh, I collected a Phoebe behind my house last week. And you say, no. Okay, I mean, we are developing a science resource and it should be there forever and for the whole communi community. But if we had a, a colleague who was at an institution that does not invest and does not essentially pay that time and money tax that you know, Rob Moyle has paid and I have paid and, and others have paid, we expect them at least to, to appreciate the effort, you know, blood, sweat and tears and money that have gone into developing that resource. And so I think we've probably said no in, in 20 some years, we've probably said no maybe four times and yes, you know, hundreds of times. But this is a career thing. Uh, in different parts of your career, you have different requirements and, and you are asked different things. I mean, you and Moyle are already in the... Yeah, know, but Moyle and I in, invested in the collecting dimension when we were at the beginnings of our career at a time where the requirements were different. You know, they had the same complaining about, about, you know, not enough time to be academics and collectors at the same time. I heard that same stuff in the 80s and 90s. So you don't think anything has changed? Um, I think that, that we have fewer overall resources for specimen collection, but they're concentrated in fewer institutions. And so there are 
perhaps more vibrant institutions now than there were 30, 40 years ago? But the academic requirements for, for, for promotion for young people are changing. Jorge, the requirement, the, the, the requirement for academic productivity in your and my department of a faculty member is one paper per year. Yeah, but uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't be hired as a, as an associate professor with that kind of productivity. Um, you need, and besides, even if we so many of us resisted, they're going to say, "Where are your papers in science? Where are your papers in PNAS? Where are your papers in nature?" And one is not enough. You need to have ten, and if you have twenty, then you are ahead of the pack, and so on. It's 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 a reality. And, 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 and that reality has a lot of consequences. It does, but I, I don't think that that says that a, a scientist who has the dimension of field work or long-term uh, population ecology work or collecting, I don't think that they're at a disadvantage because they're investing in data and materials that will serve them long into the future. Yeah, yeah sure, of course. But that, so, that's the entire career. But you are in this stage of your career. Right. But they are investing as an assistant professor or as a graduate student or as a postdoc in things that will produce in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term. Maybe what the responsibility that people in your and my stage of our careers is, is to ensure that we differentiate and we make allowances for different stages in the career and ask different questions and different requisites. I agree. I'm afraid I gotta go. Uh, and I apologize to everybody for the more interrupted and less orderly nature of my presence on this call, but that's life in the school year during COVID-19. So live with it, okay? <laughs> Why are you reclining like the Maha desnuda of Goya? Because my granddaughters stole my desk and my chair. Okay. And so I am reclining on their bed because it's the only place that's left to me because my office, the next room over, is not available. The Maha desnuda. You remind me of that. <laughs> I'm not going there, Jorge. Okay. Okay, you guys, thank you very much. And we'll be back next week with a pure question and answer session, no videos. Anyhow, have a good week. You too. Thanks a lot, guys. Good discussion. Bye. Bye.